Hi, and thank you so much for clicking on The Justin Root Show. It is another pinch me moment. If you've watched my show at all, you know I'm a huge fan of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. It's like my Lord of the Rings. It's my Harry Potter. But I'm probably going to blow your mind by telling you before I introduce you that I kind of am most excited to talk about another movie you did. Robert Altman's Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean. Jimmy Dean, one of my absolutely favorite movies. Please welcome Mr. Mark Patton. Hello, everyone. Thank, thank you me. so oh, much for you. coming and doing this. Oh, thanks. Well, you set that up beautifully because you had me at the word Altman. So it's always nice to talk about Bob's film and uh, that part of my life, which is very wonderful. Well, before we get into that, mm -hmm. I want to know how a Kansas City boy became an actor. Well, I, um, out of self-preservation, probably, I started in the theater when I was a kid. And who or what inspired you? Like, what got you into that? Well, I like to say that I was a, you know, a sister from another planet. I just didn't belong where I was. I had this sense of destiny from the time I was very small. I always knew that I was going to be famous. I was a gymnast, and then I kept breaking my legs, and my dad put an end to that. Like literally breaking your legs? Oh yeah, I broke this one twice, this one once. I was the national champion, junior national champion on the Stillbrook. So I started doing theater. He said, you have to choose one or the other, so I chose the theater. And I was not a very good student, and I was bullied in school pretty tremendously. Mm -hmm. Not like head in the toilet kind of stuff, but it was just really, it's hard to describe, but you know. You don't have to, I'm from Indiana, yeah, I think it's the same thing. It was just, that just, there was nothing that I could do that was right. So, I mean, I tried everything, but it just didn't work. So my theater teacher actually told me, um, a woman, her name was Mildred, and she laid out a couple of After Dark magazines uh, on her desk for me to swipe. And I know she wanted me to swipe them, so I took them. And they were like homosexual theatrical guides, really, from that time in the 1970s. And she told me to go to New York. Really? And yeah. is there anyone in pop culture that you're like, are you watching TV or movies thinking oh, sure. that Cher? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, I watched Cher from the time I was a little boy. And my dad would say, because in my, where I came from, it was the Cher show and the Dolly Parton show were on at the same time. And my dad was like, he really liked Dolly Parton, but he couldn't understand why I liked Cher. And I would like be right up at the top, you know, watching the shoes. I knew all the outfit. And then I was doing the theater and I did cabaret or West Side Story or whatever, you know, you were doing. In and Kansas I, City? In Kansas okay. City, yeah. And then there was the homosexual enclave was there. And they opened my eyes to, um, that I was going to have a life less ordinary. And what's happening with your sexuality at this time? I mean, are you oh, completely aware? Or? Oh God, yeah. I mean, I was, I was born knowing I was gay. I tell a story in the documentary of like, which is one of my favorite stories of my whole life. When I was a little boy, about four or five years old, I used to decorate my bunk bed and I'd make drapes and it was a, like a litter that I was going to be carried on. And I was being carried off to meet, the, to marry the king. I was going to go marry the king. I had beautiful clothes on, but I was a boy. And I knew I was a boy and I wasn't a girl and he was the king and he was a man and we were going to get married and we were going to rule the planet together. And, and I also knew that I should never tell anybody. Yes. So I didn't. And I had a fabulous dad. We had a, you know, life and it was very accepted for me. I was Your never, family was accepting. I was never, uh, you know, there were a couple of incidents like with my mom or whatnot where they really didn't know what they were doing. And my grandparents were awful. Uh, they were like, oh, your hair, my Grandfather was a minister. Why do you wear your hair that way? Boys don't wear bracelets, you know. Mm -hmm. And they were Pentecostal people and Catholic. So it was a rough godshot. But I had this awareness that, like, even when I was, say, 14 years old, I, when I was getting a lot of pressure re religiously, um, I thought, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. There's wow. something wrong with these people. These people are crazy. And when I roll over, I just won't believe in it anymore. And which I did. I mean, I rolled over and was like, one of the, and one of the big things that I'm very aware of with younger gay kids and whatnot is to be able to, them to reclaim their spirituality because it's a rape. It's a real rape of people. So anyway, so I did that. And then I knew my problem was only one of geography. And I knew as soon as I got the fuck out of there, I would be just fine. And so by the time I was 17, I was stepping off the subway at, uh, in Christopher Street and I knew I had landed exactly where I belonged. Wow. And I got on a plane on February 18th. That's amazing. And to bring it full circle, I said to myself, oh, if I do something in five years, I can do something in five years, uh, then I'm on the right track, right? So I opened on Broadway and come back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, on February 18th, 1982, five years to the day. Though. To the day? To the minute. I have a plan. I made it by you 30 minutes. Kidding. I saw the plane ticket and the opening night program. 
Yeah, I mean, literally, I arrived <sighs> in, in town at 7.30 uh, in the evening, and, and Broadway shows you open at 6.30 in the evening, curtain goes up so they can get you in the newspaper on time. So yeah, by half an hour, I made that five years. What I love about um, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean, I'm going to shorten it, because oh, sure, the 11-word sure. title's a bit much. Yes. What I love about it so much is that the cast of the film mm-hmm. is the original Broadway cast. Yeah. Everybody, right? Everybody. Yeah. That's in, like that wouldn't happen today. No, well, actually, the reason that happened was because Robert Altman could get any movie money to make a film. He was in big financial trouble at this point okay. because um, he was well, he just never made any money. Gotcha. And and he wasn't trustable. The studios didn't consider him trustable at this mm-hmm. point. It was post mash and all of that kind of stuff. So he saw the script for Jimmy Dean as a way to make a movie, the way that he could get the funds to make the movie was to sucker these Broadway guys into putting it on Broadway and then he could make the film because he was a super duper con man. He was very smart, but he was a shyster and you know, he cut corners like Jimmy Dean hadn't been released on Blu-ray for our DVD for 30 years. And the reason was he was very good friends with Phyllis McGuire. Okay. And the McGuire sisters are all the music. Sure. Sincerely. Uh, they have 13 songs in that film. Well, he didn't pay for the rights. Wow. He didn't get any permission. He just made the movie and threw it out there. And then she died. Phyllis died in the airs. One of the women. Uh, and so it took 30 years to get wow. that released. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, Mark, Kansas, New York, Cher, yeah. Broadway. Well, they say, you know, don't meet your idols. Oh, I loved her. Oh, she's amazing. She, Cher was... The way that went down was we started rehearsing at St. Clement's in New York. We all came, and you know, New York theater is very high archival, mm-hmm. so there's ways that you're supposed to protect yourself. So Sandy's there, and she's saying hello, and Karen's there, and Kathy Bates is the hall monitor, because mm-hmm. she's telling everybody what they can and can't do. And there's me, and I'm very nervous, and I have new outfits, and I've got my backpack with my books, and I thought, I'm going to show them I'm really smart, so I, I brought William Goldman's the season with me. Well, the center of the Goldman book is he just tears Sandy Dennis apart, like that she's a freak of nature and that she shouldn't. So I'm like, and Kathy's like, shut that fucking door. She can't read that in front of her. And then Sandy said, oh, he can read it. And when he's through, like, he, he, I'll tell you how the band destroyed my career. But So we're all there. And then Cher came in late and she had a little assistant with her and he was set up her foot bath and everything. So he was just getting a little pedicure, you know, while we're doing the read through. And you all you heard because we're the understudies there, the girls, not me. I was the only boy. And you heard like twelve women go, "Cunt!" Oh wow! And she could feel it. You know, like, we never saw that boy again. Wow! Oh, he was gone. Stephen was gone. We never saw him one and never again. Wow. There was no star treatment. She knew that she had broken a rule, and and she's very smart. And she was a theater girl by day three. And then on the weekend, I wasn't a Studio Fifty Four boy. And I just got this feeling, go to Studio 54, go to Studio 54. So I got all dressed up and I went to Studio 54 and there, and across, like in a key light, sitting across the room, was Cher on a couch, alone. And she was like, hey, and come over. And so I came over and she goes, I knew it would be somebody and I really thought it would be you. And I sat down and we were best friends. She, I think she conjured me there. And I, uh, and she took me under her wing and I, of course, fell absolutely in love with her. I mean, like, guiled by her. Yeah. And when whenever, you know, I became her wingman, and she just loved me. And at the time, she was 37 years old. I thought she was really old. Yeah. And I never shut up. Yeah. I just followed with That's her. That's happy See, I love actress share. I mean, I love pop star share, yeah. but I will take actress share over pink wig mega share. Any oh, day. absolutely. And I, 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 this, Sandy Dennis is one of my all-time favorite yeah, actresses. Yeah. Um, I became very friendly with Karen Black yeah. before she died. I went to a couple yeah. parties at her hot. Like, she was a very... She was a... You know, she was a very nice lady. Yeah. And it wasn't until later in my life that I realized what a genius actress she mm-hmm. was. I mean, literally, if you really watch Jimmy Dean, the star of Jimmy Dean is Karen. It is incredible. Watching it last night, I was thinking, aside from maybe some of the dialogue, mm-hmm. this could come out today. Oh, yeah. It's such a topical... I mean, you play a gay character who becomes, spoiler alert, but trans. Yeah, well, you have Karen to... Karen Black starts to, or becomes you, essentially. Right. No, you know, it's so weird because it's so interesting because we did that, and 
And I played a trans person, but they didn't even have the name for it at that point. Yeah. You know, people would say, well, he's a gay boy, and then he decided to have a sex change. John Cameron Mitchell and I were talking about this, because if you ask him, he doesn't think that Hedwig is a trans person. And he talks about it. And, like, he has a big trans following. It's, he's, it's a mistake. Yeah. A mistake was made. You know, to get him out of the country, he was cut. And, but he had chosen that. And I, we always decided the same was true of Joe that he just had no other option, that he was probably a gay boy. And he made the mistake of taking on an identity that didn't belong to him. Because Karen, you know, she says, did you regret it? And so only every day. Yeah. yeah. And what's crazy is that, I mean, Sandy Dennis had already won her Oscar for yeah. Virginia Woolf. Robert Altman had Nashville. Mm -hmm. He had MASH. And to take on, at this stage in his career, this story, this subject matter, mm -hmm. I mean, was it... It had to be very, like, nowadays you'd have a consultant on set. Right. You'd have trans, several trans oh, we had, consultants. Oh, we had but, trans people all over the place. Really? Oh, absolutely. And one of them oh. was a cute little, she, she looked like uh, Ava Peron. And Woolworth, Woolworths threw a party for us. The CEO of Wool picked her up. Wow. Thinking she was a woman and she became his mistress. It's a hot topic now with um, Scarlett Johansson, you know, just said, I don't know if you know this, but she was just saying as an actor, she is entitled to play trans if she wants, because it's her job. She can play a tree. You know, I this it. was her trans yeah. or anything. How do you feel about actors and how specific we have to be today? How culturally appropriate we have to be? I mean, do you believe that a straight man can play a gay part or oh, a straight man can play trans? Sure. Why not? I mean, gay men were expected to play straight men for their whole lives, mm -hmm. and the most, the greatest actors in the world were gay men. You know, I honestly, uh, and this will sound awful, but I really won't let newly half chicks tell me how to walk through my life. I won't let an 18 year old or a 19 year old, because I was 18 or 19, who just came into consciousness and say, you know, you're not allowed to do this. And like, uh, like with all the gender boundaries and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm also getting to the point where I just won't accept people saying that you don't matter because you're a cis male gay man. You just shut up and sit down. Because acting is supposed to be magical. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get myself in trouble. I know how to stay out of trouble, but I will tell you this. It's like television and movies can be a teaching tool, but their primary purpose is to be entertainment. And you can lie and say, I don't see color. Or you can lie and say, I don't see a trans person as a trans person. Like, I see this beautiful trans woman over there. But am I supposed to lie and say that I don't know she's trans? And even Laverne Cox, who's like probably the most fabulous trans woman in the world, is a trans woman. You know, uh, she's recognizable as a trans woman. And I think that we should celebrate that, actually. So I say to Scarlett, play whatever part you can. If you can get somebody to find you and do it. But then when you're doing that, make sure that you make some room on the set for some trans people. Like, pay it forward in different ways and set up a foundation where, you know, be Ryan Murphy, you know, who just insists that everybody above the line is either trans, gay, or, or lesbian. And the middle people can be anything they want, but at the top of the ticket, it's got to be those people who are in power. Because actors have no power. The people that have power are directors, writers, producers. And those are where you want the trans people. Those are where you want the gay people. So they can control the narrative. Okay, so it comes out. Mm -hmm. And now where are we with your agent, with your Hollywood life? Here's your first movie, Robert Altman, gay character. Well, I, you know, I, I worked in New York quite a bit. And also I was doing, I started to do television work in New York. And I came here for pilot season. And then my life changed. I mean, I got here and I, circumstances of my life completely changed. I met somebody that I fell in love with okay. who was a TV star. So I was here. And so I, I would take jobs on like General Hospital and stuff like that okay. to support myself. And, and is this a TV star who's not out? Uh, not at the time. Well, there not was nobody out okay. at the time. His name was Timothy Patrick Murphy. He was on Dallas was this last job. Okay. Well, no, Son of Sam was his last, the Michael Landon story oh, was sure. his last thing. But he died okay. uh, during the AIDS crisis. In the beginning of. And so I was nailed in with that. I mean, we were a couple and, uh, and I began to work here. And so that's how the transition to California came out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this huge horror movie comes out called A Nightmare on Elm Street. Had you seen it? I screen tested for the first one. Whoa. But I never saw it. Whoa. Yeah, to play Glenn. I've never Heather heard that. I, the Johnny yeah. Depp part? Yeah. I've Heather, never heard that. Heather and I, uh, I remember sitting with Heather on, because I had the same experience with Heather and Kim. 
we were in a trailer somewhere, so it must have been Gower, and we were sitting outside, and Wes was inside, and they were talking, and we were going to read together. This is the first time we would read, read together. And Heather was going off to Stanford, I think, and I said, well, if you're getting the lead in the movie, you delay the semester, take this now, because you'll never, you know, might, this might, opportunity might never come again. And so she did the movie. And then the same thing happened with Kim. Kim delayed her uh, Syracuse to do Nightmare on Street 2. Wow. So then part two comes along and... Well, it was a call. You know, I mean, like, they're like whenever there's a movie in Los Angeles going down, there's about 10 boys at any time that are being considered for that movie. And they all look like you, and they're all similar. Or, you know, it was like at my time, it was like, what's the guy's name from uh, Back to the Future? Oh, Michael J. Fox. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Eric Stoll. Yeah. Myself. Uh, Brad Pitt at that time. There were about 10, 20 guys, all different, but all the same age and all the same vibe. And you knew that nobody outside that group was going to get the part. You would all audition for it and somebody would get it. Those, that would be the end. And I would always be like in the last two or three, you know, I like, um, I turned down some movies, which I probably shouldn't have. I turned down 16 Candles. I turned down a couple of John Hughes films. And, uh, cause I was going to do Falcon and the Snowman with, uh, Sean Penn, mm. and that was more the direction that I wanted to go in, because uh, I consider myself a serious actor, which in Los Angeles is not a good thing to consider. Sure, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So. I, like I, yeah, I, I cut, cut at the last minute for Beverly Hills 90210 because uh, I don't really think I have the right clothes on, you know, so I wasn't a Beverly Hills kid, but, you know, we, that was what life was. That's what you did, yeah. Yeah. So anyone who knows Nightmare on Elm Street 2 mm-hmm. knows all about its the lore, yeah. the lore and everything. And for those who don't, it is the one in the series that ha- now has cult status, mm-hmm. perhaps known as the gay Nightmare right. on Elm Street. You get that script. Is it obvious to you? Oh, no, no. Well, first of all, the script wasn't completed. Okay. So because it was turned around so quickly. Okay. The, it was filmed. We were filming in June. Jeez. And we were out on screen and on Halloween. So if you know anything about film making, that's insane. That's insanely fast. I really later, as all of this got discussed, I came to the conclusion that nobody had read the script, that the producer hadn't read the script, that the director had not read the script. Most of the actors had not read the script. Okay. But I don't, I still, to this day, I think maybe Jack never actually read the script, the director. Yeah. And because of the chaos, David, the writer was rewriting it constantly. And there were two units shooting so, like, the part with the gym coach was shot by, not by Jack Shoulder, was shot by a first AD. Really? So, I don't think he ever saw it, honestly, wow. until he was editing. And the more David got away with his, like, what he thought were subtle things, he kept changing things. And he just sabotaged his own movies, basically, what he did. And then the set designers, you know, like, they dressed, the, because it was so fast, you didn't really have time to dress the set yourself and pay attention. So, they were putting homo articles here and there and no chicks allowed and this it was all just a big joke you know that turned into a nightmare for some people you know so uh for me it turned into a nightmare so it comes out and you're at the premiere i'm imagining that's the first time you saw it no i actually saw it at mgm you did okay. yeah and um, what were your thoughts like what well i used to tell the story in a very different way than i do now okay. because of my documentary because my documentary has been uh very cathartic. It's been a learning process. It took a long time to do. It took a number of years. I used to say that when I saw that movie, I was like, oh my God, you know, well, I don't look good or the thing, but I'm a, I'm a movie star and I'm so excited and all that kind of stuff, which is a lie. The first thing I looked at it was if people could tell I was gay. Wow. And if I had uh, revealed too much of myself, which I had because of that script, because there was no way that if the butchest guy in the world had played that part, it would have the same reaction. Absolutely. You know, and because of the self hate and whatnot at the time, it was tragic because I had spent a lifetime trying to convince people that I could play straight. And this destroyed my opportunity. My agents took me aside afterwards and said, well, it's obvious you can carry a movie, but you have to be a character person because you can't play straight. And I literally said that to you. Oh yeah. Flat out. And then, uh, and I had played straight boys before, to much success where nobody would ever question. But I began to think when they said that, that I was a freak and it was, it was very hurtful. Uh, when people say that the movie was a flop, I always just direct them back to like, know your facts. It wasn't, it was highly successful financially. Got great reviews from like the New York times, the London times, me personally got fabulous reviews yeah. and it built new line cinema. 
The house that Freddie built. That's right. And it had not been for Elm Street 2. But then Wes came back for 3. For 3, yeah. And Heather did. Yeah, and in, a, and in an act of total disrespect to people, decided that the part 2 didn't exist. Okay. So 1 goes to 3, and then 2 becomes the outlier, you know, and they began to beat up on it. So Scream Queen, uh -huh. My Nightmare on Elm Street. Right, I like 1. Which one. is... Kind of, well, it's premiering now, and it's doing festivals now, and Outfest this week. I haven't seen it yet, so my apologies to people watching this interview who have seen it. Well, no, really, nobody's allowed to see it. Okay. So, you know, like, you're, you're, you're okay. a good company that we're even talking about. It, well, so. I can't wait till tomorrow night to oh, get to see you. it. So, again, I apologize if I'm redundant or asking mm -hmm. questions. Well, I'll, I'll, be I'll, very I'll, no, I'll, I'll, I'll guide you. There. Okay. I thank understand you. what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, what kind of blows my mind is that anyone would even doubt the success of it because three, four, five come out, part six comes out, new nightmare, a remake in 2000, whenever the remake came out. I mean, one of the biggest, most successful franchises of all time. Mm -hmm. Was there a point after it where you see three come out and you see the success and part four that alleviates any sort of maybe pressure you had to think like, Oh, I was in the one that... Oh, wait. Well, no, I never thought that. First of all, I never... That, what other people's consciousness about my reality, what other people believe, I don't accept it as reality. Okay. I'm, I'm proud of the movie. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think Jesse's a great character. Mm -hmm. I think I did a really good job in it. All of my peers thought I did a really good job in it. And there were some 14-year-old boys who were having trouble with homosexuality mm -hmm. that like decided to throw bricks at it. Mm -hmm. But that's not my problem. Mm -hmm. But by the time I wasn't interested in it, I left show business. Well, that's what I want. Okay, so uh, how far after the movie came out? Okay, pretty much immediately. Yeah. Okay, but so when you say you don't let anyone alter your reality or alter what you think, About something my, happened. My performance. Well, yeah, sure. 1985. Okay. I had a, a lover who was dying of AIDS. Mm -hmm. I had uh, an industry was shutting out gay people right and left. Uh, you had to be really butch. You had to have a girlfriend. You had to go back in the closet. When you were signing for a series, you had to take a blood test. And the homophobia inside of Hollywood was unbelievable. And the people who were the most homophobic were homosexuals. Casting directors, uh, agents, managers. And they beat it into your head that if you were gay, nobody would want you. And they destroyed a lot of lives. And I just decided, I was at CBS, I was a applying to be on a television show, which was a gay character on TV. And I had in the dark room at CBS, those voices calling out, well, at a big long table, how would you feel about, I mean, can you handle playing a gay character? How would your girlfriend play, feel about it? I mean, if, would, if people were making fun of you, would, you, would it break your relationship up with your girlfriend? And these are all gay men asking me these questions and they're showing me how to stay in the closet. And I said, you know what, this is not for me. And my break from show business was very clean. One day I was in it, and one day I was not. Because I said, don't send any more calls my way. I'm not interested in pursuing this because it's it's not for me. I'm going to go someplace where I can be happy. Because I came into this to be happy, not to be... I didn't want to be unhappy at UPS, and I don't want to be unhappy in Hollywood. Because I don't need any of this. Okay. West Hollywood was covered with cadavers walking down the street. Old men... Don, you meet, I'd see you today, six months later, I'd see you, you'd be an old man. If I didn't see you in a year, you were dead. So it really had nothing to do with Hollywood. Yeah. It had more to do with AIDS and the reaction to, of Hollywood to AIDS by saying that like, if you are, if you're a feminine or you're softer, or if you're Timothy Chalamet, or if you're any of these boys today, yeah. you would never have an opportunity to work. And, um, I didn't know that Nightmare on Elm Street was the, the, the number one fran film franchise in the world because I didn't care. I moved away. I didn't pay any attention. Yeah. Paid no attention at all. I wasn't, wasn't really interested in it. So you officially quit in 1985? Is that 86. 86. Mm -hmm. And then when did you, you moved to Mexico? Well, I moved to Palm Beach, Florida. You moved to Palm Beach first. Yeah. Okay. Well, I went back to New York. I hung around. I mean, these were my homes. I had a home in New okay. York. I had a, um, and then I went to Palm Beach to work for money for, cause I worked in the very high end level of design and, and I became sick. I mean, I almost died. So, uh, a good chunk of that time was taken up with that. Cause when I was, after Tim died many, many years later, you know, I was diagnosed with full blood AIDS. So it was in what year, uh, I was 40. So, um, 20 years ago. 
20 years ago. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so then a lot of my life came towards recovering from that. But I was very lucky in the fact that the protease inhibitors just came out. Uh, had I gotten sick a year earlier, I would have probably been dead. And I just, you know, I went through that, that more. I, I will tell you as we, like, well, as we begin, continue this conversation, I have a feeling you don't really know what screen green line at your home street is about. And it's, uh, and it's not about Freddy Krueger. No, I, 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 I'm a, I mean, I know you do, but, but I mean, for those who think that it's a, it's a Nightmare on Elm Street movie, it's not. No, no. From what I have read, I maybe, right. hopefully I'm, yeah. I get this right, right, that the two filmmakers who are, mm-hmm. uh, are present. That's right, Roman and Tyler. Yes. Um, kind of hunted you down after several years of where did he go? What happened to him? And you appeared in the 2010 Never Known Street documentary, Never Sleep Again. Yes, they're the one that found me. Tommy found me. Well, actually, they put a private detective looking for me because I lived in Mexico and I didn't have a cell phone. I don't have a computer, none of that. I live very much off the grid. I'm married to a Mexican man. You know, my interlocutor to the world was my sister-in-law. Okay. And she was under instructions to, if somebody asked me, because I was offered movies for many, many years. And the answer was just no. Don't bother me. I don't want to know about it. Because I went through a tremendous amount of, uh, I don't want to say I was was never unhappy with my life. But my life and the life of my peers have been very dramatic. And I really wanted to be left alone. I wanted nobody to bother me. And so they found me, Tommy found me, and two days later I came to Los Angeles uh, to shoot Never Sleep Again. And I told them that I would only film it if if they would allow me to tell the truth about the way the movie came about, who David Chaskin was, that he had been lying about the way he wrote the film. And they did. And in the process, and I liked the movie, but they made a joke of it. And all of a sudden, one more time, it was like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was a blowjob joke. And it was just a joke. And like, that's where Roman and Tyler came in because there were a lot of queer boys out there that loved this movie mm-hmm. and really felt like it had been screwed with for so long. And then I got pissed. I dug into the internet. I started finding out what was written about me, lies that were written about me, interviews that people had given where they'd say like, oh, you know, Mark went totally crazy because of this and this and this. And I hadn't seen those people since the day I stepped off the set. So they don't know anything about me. I mean, most of the people in Nightmare on Elm Street I'd never met. I realized at some point that um, that there was a lot of power in my photo. How I realized how popular I was. Because you're doing conventions now, right. and you're... And I understood that the power of photos with me in that glove were very powerful. Okay. So I took a three... I had a three-year plan on the conventions. I decided that I would go on the convention road, and I would talk about first bullying. And all these people had been bullied. You know, all the horror fans had generally sure. been. Sure. Because they were weirdos. And absolutely, and yeah. And, freaks and all. And so they responded to that. And the next year I talked about homophobia and they went with me. And then the third year I decided I would reveal my HIV status to them. And I would teach them about HIV AIDS because a lot of those kids were doing like blood play and they didn't think any of the stuff applied to them. It's like, Oh, I can pretend to be a vampire and play with somebody's blood and I'm not going to get sick because I'm not gay. Mm. And I did that for a full year. And then I was on the cover of the advocate uh, with uh, my glove saying, you know, something like Freddy Krueger couldn't kill him and neither could AIDS. And, and that traveled around the world. And all of a sudden I had cred in that community. And then my initial instinct for a documentary was I wanted to find out about all the boys who were me, who had been in show business and had just disappeared in 1985 or 86 because either they were dead or they'd been kicked out or went into exile. And that sort of went off the rails and Roman and Tyler were working inside of this machine that was starting to build a documentary. And then they took control of it. And the three of us became a unit. The documentary is very holistic. It's happening before your eyes, the transformation of different people, breaking through their consciousness, me getting healed from doing this. Finally, you know, everybody from the film is involved. And everybody from Nightmare on Elm Street is involved. And there's a lot of, like, come to Jesus moments. And so it's, it was really powerful. I'm sure this is in it, but maybe you can't tell me, but have there been apologies? Have there been... Um, yeah, well, amends were... Uh, have amends, been made. yeah. Yeah, I will, absolutely. And, you know, probably the biggest around David, you know, because really, you know, a lot of it's about, you know, 
the writer, mm-hmm. David Cheskin. I was like, like most of my friends, gay friends, you know, I was pretty much brutalized from the time I was a little child by other boys and stuff. And nobody ever broke my spirit. Nothing broke my spirit. You couldn't break my spirit today. I let him, I gave him the power to break my spirit. And so what I do in the movie is I take it back. It's yeah. just that standing that this is going on with someone like me, who's mm-hmm. about 12 years old, seeing this movie. Right. Just, you're speaking to me. I don't know what yet, because right. I'm not quite aware. Right. There were a lot of you boys. I wasn't right. as far along as you were with right. my second. I'm a boy later. <laughs> but to me, it, it, it just represents, I mean, sadly, the opposite of what it was representing for you, because it was, I like that guy. Something like I had a huge crush on you. Not oh, gonna lie. Not gonna lie. That's so sweet. And it was, but I didn't know. I wasn't sure what to do with that right. yet. But it just represented this wonderfulness to me, and it, it it and it's doing it for people now. And I know you know this. Now. Oh, I do know. Oh, I know you know this. And I know it. I've known it for a while. Um, there's a part in the documentary where, uh, without spoiling too much, uh, somebody says to me, "Well, you should just get over it mm-hmm. because it really isn't about you." Mm-hmm. And, and I say, well, I don't say this in the movie, but I'll say it to you now. It's like, that's me on the screen. I'm the person that everybody's talking to. So if it's not about me, who's it about? Who the hell is it about? Do you know what I mean? And if anybody gets to take ownership of the abuse that was heaped upon that thing. And I thought that boys and girls would respond to me the way that you did. And there were people consciously not seeing me. And gay people, you know, we do things like, the movie is really homophobic. I mean, you know that. Right? Oh, sure. Um, but we took the choice bits out of it for ourselves. We have a doctor who talks about this quite a bit in the film. Uh, we scavenger. And I've had so many boys say to me, like, oh, you know, it's like you were the first boy I ever saw that I thought would love me back. Or I pretended you were my boyfriend. Or, oh, you know, you're a part of my fantasy life. I mean, I'm, I think I'm a fodder for a lot of unborn children. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And it's tr- and it's lovely, and I love it, and I'm thrilled to. I mean, it's the part that I play in life now. I mean, it's my des- This was my destiny to be this boy, you know, to be this man, because we're telling the story now, which is really super important. And I feel like in the the arc of my life, right, that I only did Nightmare on Street two, so I could have this conversation with you today. The conversation that we're having with Screen Queen is a very important conversation for boys like you. Okay. Yeah. So that you, you know, we, I think as we matured, we had to get rid, shave off the parts of ourselves that were so beautiful to be acceptable. And I learned to fall in love with myself, the way my hands move, the way I speak, the, the light part of me. I had to work really. I was like, I could never understand why people were attracted to me. Do you ever have that feeling? Yeah. Okay. And then one day I saw a boy on television. He's a fashion designer. And I was watching him and I was like, oh, he's so charming. And he's really into, and he looks just about like I looked. And he moves his hands, and he's like out, and he's always putting men in his clothes, and everything's gender fucked. And he's so smart. And I was like, oh my God, that's what people saw when they saw me. And so I learned to fall in love with that part of myself, which is one of the reasons I really didn't want to act again, because I don't want to act like somebody else. And I don't ever want to put myself in the position where I think that beauty is a straight boy. I'm not a straight boy. I don't want to be a straight boy. If you if you could strike me straight when I was 17, I would say absolutely not. Amen. You know, I love that. I love, love it, that. and I love those kind of hot looking boys. But I don't want to be one. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, I don't want to be that thing. I want to be who I am, and I'm proud of it. It took me. A, it was a long journey to get here. Of self love. Yeah, you know? sure. You know? And when you when you're 40 <laughs> feet high, and you have people on the internet going faggot, he screams like a girl, or many things. You know, it's like we've had to work things out in the Nightmare on Elm Street world too. Conventions didn't want to have us. They like don't. No, we're not interested. You know, in Nightmare on Elm Street too. Um, and I still, oh, sometimes, yeah, sure. Because it's changing now because like a lot of drag queens and stuff, like Peaches Christ is taking over touring and a lot of stuff. And all those guys that own those conventions are all straight white guys. And they want like Linnea Quigley and, and they want the sex girls as a sex object. And all of a sudden these drag queens and queers and homos and interesting people are coming along saying, well, that's not the only thing we're interested in. We're interested in this and this and this, and we want it too. And they're like, no, I don't want that. They want to keep control. 
But we're taking control. Before you know, we'll have our own convention. <laughs> I'll have my own convention. I'll rule the world with Miranda Priestley. Yeah, pull that down so we can see it. I love uh, Miranda Priestley. My friend Bill gave this to me. Okay, that's all. Um, uh, okay, Emily. <laughs> it's not a question. As someone who left this business because it wasn't accepted, mm -hmm. what is it like to watch it being so widely accepted today? I mean, we have Billy Porter just got nominated. Gay kissing on television now is not even a thing anymore. There are so many gay, not so many, but there are a lot of. Yeah, sure. Oh no, actually, we're, it, what, we're changing. That's great. Is or, there a little bit of bitterness though watching no, it now? Why? Because I have it, and I think, oh, you do? yeah, I do. Yeah, no, you know, I had an agent who said the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you look okay, but is anyone going to believe you with a girl? Yeah. And I hadn't said it to myself yet. Oh, and I left. Sorry. Yeah. You know, and it's just awful. And we in. I tried to hide myself for the longest mm -hmm. time. And so I have a slight, it's not a bitterness, but it's a, wow, you guys today really don't know what. Oh, well, I, I preach that What story. people like you saw and what well, I've seen. Well, I'm going to tell you, like tomorrow night after the film, you're going to walk up to me and you're going to go, oh my. I know. I'm you just, like, Why did I have the interview then? No, because I'm, well, I'm going to tell you, because you're going to see your story. And you're going to see what you can do with your story. Yeah. Because, like, our stories, your story's not finished yet. What we've been doing is be letting people bring the real you to, this, to, the, to the table. You're doing that right now with your... The reason things are different right now for those Timothys and those boys and Connor Jessup mm -hmm. and those boys, right? The reason it's different is because of people like you and me. See, like, you're sitting here being yourself. And you're modeling this for people. I model it every place I go. I have an Instagram account that I insist on every other day posting a beautiful photo or video of boys kissing. It's not sexual, but it's beautiful. And it's like, because I have a lot of straight people who follow me and I want to sensitize them to the boys kiss. What's, uh, what's the problem? Where we are the people that you have to stand up and you have to accept what your destiny was or what your karma was. And don't be bitter about it. Yeah. It would like, trust me, there were people that went before us to have much worse than we did. Much worse. You know, uh, thrown into jail, humiliated in public. Yeah. But we chose a public life, right? And we decided to have our catharsis in public, right? Mm -hmm. And we're having it in public and people get to see it and it's okay, you know? So yeah. it'll be better tomorrow. We'll be there pushing them along. And then maybe we'll make movies as old men. I was going to say, do you want to keep doing it? Did, have you? Has, well, I've had people offer, you know, all my life. I, but do I, you want to? I'm actually doing a movie by choice uh, starting in the end of August. Yeah. And and I want to do this film Yeah, that I'm doing. I've done two little ones just for, sure. to see if my face looked okay. <laughs> or if I could work with this. Could I work with being an older man as opposed to being a nonchalant? It's a different gig altogether. And I don't want to play. I never had any desire to play tropey gay uncles or, you know, Paul Lynn parts. I don't want to Uncle Tom my life in any sense of the word. I don't, out of vanity sense, have any desire to ever be seen on screen again. Okay. No, it, it's not interesting to me. You know, I was a beautiful boy and that was captured. Those years were captured and they can't be reclaimed. I can't ever be him again. You know, okay. so I enjoyed it. You it might not be a beautiful boy, but you're a beautiful man. Ah, oh, thank you. You are. So well, sweet. Well, it's not sweet. It's very true. So thank it's you. It's very true. I've been noticing men that, like, I would marry in a second lately, and, you know, they're all age appropriate for me. And I'm like, wow. And they, they're like, I've been married a long time. Too, sure. So, yeah. Can you give one little sum up of advice to any young gay kids out there watching right now? I will give the advice that my father gave to me because my man was a really wise man in a really harsh show. But one day I was having trouble and my dad, I was in the bathroom and he turned around to look in the mirror and he said, and he pointed to me in the mirror and he said, always be on his side. And, um, right. and it's come back, you know, I'm always on my side. Yeah. And you should always be on your side. If there's plenty of room to respect other people, but when it comes down to, or share in show business, Always do what's best for you because that's what everybody around you will be doing. What's best for them. 
I feel like I've talked to you for two seconds. You probably feel like we've been here for nine days. So. Oh no, I'm on the I'm on the junket. I'm just I, like it's all. You don't want to meet people like this when they're doing this kind of oh thing. Oh god, it's all about me. Yeah, all the time. Oh, I love it. Well, I end my show with the silliest little thing ever. Sure. It's so lame, but I love it. I don't know why. It just kind of like gives a little insight. It's your show. It's my show. It's my name on it. I can do whatever what you I want. want. Exactly. Um, pizza or hot dogs? Pizza. Seventies music or eighties music? Seventies. Friday the 13th or Halloween? Halloween. Nicole Kidman or Julia Roberts? Nicole. Peacocks or flamingos? Flamingo. Las Vegas or Miami? Miami. Science or history? History, absolutely. Window seat or aisle? It used to be the window, but now it's the aisle because it's closer to the bathroom. All right. If I could turn back time or do you believe? Um, the beat goes on. Great, okay. Moonstruck or mermaids? Oh, Moonstruck. Pineapple or coconut? Pineapple. A New York City penthouse or a Malibu beach house? Penthouse. Hot air balloon or parachute? Parachute. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Jennifer Hudson or Taylor Swift? Jennifer. Flintstones or the Jetsons? Oh, the Flintstones. Burritos or tacos? It's so funny. Uh, where I live, I live in Mexico, and there are no such thing as a burrito, so I'll say it's not Okay. Uh, it's an American thing, right? Yeah, it is. It's totally contrived. Bonfire or fireplace? Bonfire. Paul Newman or Marlon Brando? Paul Newman. Same, thank you. Yeah, that's God, God, right? Audrey or Kate Hepburn? Oh, Kate. Okay. Dang. Gold or silver? Mm, well, it's depending on if I have to sell it or not, so I'll go with <laughs> always gold. Always gotta be prepared. Floral or plaid? Both. Okay. You were a designer, so I was kind of yeah. like, I wonder if I could mix it. Like, I was, yesterday I had a little plaid jacket on because I had to do something for this runway. And I was like, it was, I was like, I was gonna, I put a little plaid shirt underneath it and the colors were everywhere. I just thought, I need a pocket square and a hat and a pair of new shoes and I'll be fine. So, yes, yeah, so all and more, more. But I'm, I'm a, a neutral for sure. I'm a Virgo boy, so I like those pale okay. colors. Bloody Mary or Martini? Neither. Neither. Tennis or golf? Um,. Ideally, I don't really play either one very well, but I, I choose golf, actually. And last no, actually, I tend to use tennis because with tennis you have really good abs. Last but not least, Stevie Nicks or Stevie Wonder? Um, I think I would ship them, actually. <laughs> I'd marry Stevie to Stevie and see what we came up with, because I love them both. Oh, okay. you know, So it would be like Stevie Wondership or Stevie, how would you put their names together? I guess it would be just Stevie Wonder. Wicks. Yeah. There you go. Well, I cannot... Thank you enough for coming on this show. Oh, I firmly believe that even if you alter or change one person's life, you've done something amazing. And I can speak truly from my heart that you have uh -huh. over the years too. I don't even mean this interview, you know, just even seeing that movie thinking at least there's somebody out there That's right. like me, somebody. So thank you and continue to do what you're doing and much success. Do we know where, People are going to be able to see this. I mean, someone could be watching this six months from now. Oh, do we will. know yet? Uh, it will you know, update and we'll, yeah, no, we'll tell you. And where can people find you guys? And find just, you. You're on Instagram. What's everywhere? Your just Google Mark Patton. Mark Patton. Patton. Okay. And then uh, and I know and I'm the. It's me. Okay. I mean, I'm very interactive with people. And uh, trust me, with what's going on. No, behind our heads that we can't talk about. You won't have any trouble finding the screen queen by now. She will be right in the living room. Oh, I love that. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be so fascinating. Don't yeah. And you get watch. to see it tomorrow. I know. I so can't wait. All right. Well, I'll be there. Thank you guys so much Thank for watching. You. Please subscribe. Thank you.